Well, absolute honour to be here with this incredible panel today. My name's Jazz, I'm the host for this evening and I'm going to be predominantly listening, not saying very much, but I will just introduce myself. I'm the founder of an online community called the Worldwide Tribe and we support refugees and asylum seekers globally and we do so through education. We tell stories, I run a podcast, we make films um, and I do a lot of writing around migration and this comes from a personal place for me. I have four adopted brothers who all came to the UK as unaccompanied minors. Two of them, uh, well, two of them from East Africa, from Eritrea and uh, Sudan, one of them from Libya and one of them from Afghanistan. And it was these four boys, I guess, who led me to really dig deeper into the issue of migration beyond what I was reading in our mainstream media. But one of the regions and one of the countries that I know very little about is Malawi. And we have three objectives for this evening. Firstly, to find out more about refugees in Malawi, refugees from Malawi, and also to bring Malawi to the awareness of our international audience. And joining me to do exactly that this evening is an incredible panel. We have Jua, Nathan and Innocent here to share their wisdom with us. And I'm going to hand over to you to share a few words just to introduce yourself. So Jua, maybe you can start. Hello, my name is Dua Mutarika. I was born in Ethiopia. I am a Malawian and um, I have a deep passion in my heart for issues around refugees. And so I'm feeling very honored to be here today to be able to speak on my experience and what I've seen in my work and in my, in my life. Nathan. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Um, my name is Nathan Chiume. Uh, I was born uh, in Tanzania when my dad was uh, in exile uh, from Malawi in Tanzania. And currently I live in New York City um, and I'm a finance associate working for uh, NYU. And just like what uh, my sister Lua said, you know, I'm very grateful for all the work uh, that you guys are doing in terms of issues of migration, in terms of issues of refugee. And I'm really here to uh, lend my experience uh, in the way of my upbringing and my understanding of how these issues are affecting Malawians and Africa in, in general, uh, so that you know, we can all you know, bring more awareness to uh, what is happening in our communities. So thank you very much again for having me. Thank you, Nathan. Thank you for being here. And Innocent, if you could introduce yourself. Thank you. My name is Innocent Magambi, and uh, I'm the founder of um, There Is Hope, but also the CEO of Inua Consulting. I came here as a refugee 19 years ago, and now I'm a refugee advocate. Amazing. So having read your book, Innocent, and also having learned a little about your stories, Jura and Nathan, I actually see some parallels, Jura and Nathan, between your stories, right? That you were both born in exile. And perhaps it makes sense for us to, to start from the beginning. Um, if you are happy to share a little about what that means to be born in exile and a little bit of the context as to why you had to leave Malawi. Jua, maybe you can start. Um, I was, so I was born in um, 1974, not ashamed to say that. Um, you can calculate my age. <laughs> um, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. At that time, my family was living there um, and my father worked for the United Nations. We were, I was born in exile from Malawi. That's all my siblings and I had known our whole lives was that we could not go back to Malawi. Um, details are still a little bit um, sketchy of exactly what happened of some of the details. I, I speak with my eldest sibling and um, some cousins to try to piece together everything because it's not something necessarily that my parents um, talked about in the house. We just knew we couldn't go home. 
And so um, from, from what I understand is there was a time where um, my father specifically found himself on the wrong side of um, government's favor and felt that both himself and his, and his brother needed to leave Malawi for their safety. So they both did leave Malawi, um, both got married outside of Malawi to non-Malawians, although my mother does have um, her, her father, my maternal grandfather was originally from Malawi and moved to Zimbabwe. But so that's how we ended up leaving Malawi and how all of us were born outside of Malawi in exile. I was born in Ethiopia. My two siblings, other two, one sibling was born in Zimbabwe. My other two siblings were born in Zambia. And um, so that's where we became kind of, I guess, what would, what would be the word? There's a, there's a word for it that they say for a lot of the UN type of children. I, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a way to describe them as um, kind of- Third is it, culture um, kids. Third culture kids, that's it. So that's how we became third culture kids. And um, we basically embraced and grew up around every single race, creed. <laughs> you know, we just had a really international upbringing because of not being brought up um, at home. Was it something that your family talked about when you were growing up? Were you open about leaving Malawi and how that had felt for your parents? Did you know much around the circumstances and the emotion attached to them? The circumstances were very vague when we were growing up. We just knew we could not go home. And why specifically, we, it was very hushed. These weren't things that we talked about because also during the time I was growing up, the situation that made my parents leave was still there. So it wasn't kind of something that we felt we were told don't tell people about it. And, you know, it was something that was really talked about in hushed tones, but we were always told that there was home and it was beautiful. And one day we'd be able to go there. And there was always a sense of longing in, um, I really felt in my father's voice for him to go home and feel that sense of, this is the sun in my home. This is the soil. I'm touching the soil in my home. And um, I think he worked his whole life to return to do the things that he did because of that love and that passion and that feeling of, I want to go home. So it was always something that was in the back of his mind, but he never really discussed with us, this is why we aren't home. It was more just telling us stories and, folk tales and things like that. And you'd see the wistful look in his eyes. He wanted to go home, but he never said, I can't go home because of this. If anything, I heard about it from our peripherals, things that aunts and cousins would whisper about, family friends would say, you know, and somebody would come to school the next day and said, my mommy said, your daddy, you know, was almost put in prison or something. What did he do? And you would be like, uh, I don't know, you know, and then you're looking, you know, it was, it was that type of thing, but never where we were actually ever sat down and said, this is the situation. And, and I think in my parents' defense, they did that to, to really keep us from the trauma of whatever they went through, you know, um, and to keep us to have as normal and stabilized a, a childhood as they could, given the circumstances. Yeah, I guess as a form of protection for you, right? And did you grow up feeling different from the kids around you when people asked you where you were from? Did you say Malawi or was that a difficult question ever? Yeah, it was a little bit difficult because I always wanted to claim Malawi, but then somewhere in my mind, I felt like, well, Malawi is not claiming me because I'm not allowed to go there. But I was always Malawi and had a Malawian passport and had Malawian friends, but felt a little bit separated from Malawian culture because I'd not been able to experience it, um, I guess in the natural, I would say, you know, everything I knew about Malawi, I knew secondhand and thirdhand. And so it took until I was an adult and I was able to actually go to Malawi and experience Malawi and be part of it to say that I really knew Malawi. Before then it was, it was 
I looked at Malawi through other people's eyes because I'd not been able to experience it. So there was, I, it was where you always claim it's home, but if somebody were to ask me a question at that point in time, well, what do people do in Malawi? What do people eat? It would be like, okay, what did, what did so-and-so say? <laughs> you know, what did my father say about that? What did my uncle say about that? But never what I had experienced. And I want to hear all about that moment when you went back, or when you went to Malawi for the first time, and we'll get there. But I'd like to pass over to Nathan, because you were also born in exile, right? And I'd love to hear the circumstances around that and how that felt for you. Yes. So, yes, I was born in 1978. So I'm also not ashamed to say that. Um, uh, born in Dar es Salaam, uh, you know, my father, uh, you know, his name was Kanyama Chume. He has since passed away, but he was an um, uh, independence uh, fighter for Malawi. So he was one of the key people who uh, initiated the struggle for uh, independence of Malawi. Um, and uh, one of the key uh, leaders in the struggle for independence. And he was in the first uh, uh, majority uh, African government before independence as a first minister of education and then first minister of foreign affairs. But immediately after independence in 1964, there was what is termed as the cabinet crisis. Um, basically, you know, majority of the ministers disagreed with the prime minister and uh, there was a big backlash whereby the prime minister basically started hunting down all the cabinet ministers. And so my father had to flee the country. And um, so he, he fled to Tanzania. And, uh, and it was very natural for him to go to Tanzania because he had been to Tanzania as a young boy uh, after his uh, mother passed away when he was about the age of five. His uncle, who used to work in, in Tanzania, uh, took him to, for education. And so he lived with his uncle from a very young age, went to primary school and secondary school in, 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 in Tanganyika back then. And then, you know, before going to Uganda, Makere, and then went back to Tanzania to teach. And then, um, and then he got into trouble because he started doing politics in Tanganyika. And so he was banished back to Nyasaland. And so he went back to Nyasaland and, you know, decided to, to do the, the political independence movement. So, so when he went to exile in Tanzania, he started his life there. And, um, and he spent his entire maybe 30 years in life in exile, uh, fighting for democracy in Malawi and uh, um, doing some rebel activities to try to overthrow the government of Kamuzubanda. And so he in the end was, you know, was named or was well known in Malawi as, you know, public enemy number one, uh, probably the most hated and feared uh, uh, rebel uh, in Malawi during the Kamuzubanda era. Uh, and so we grew up in that situation whereby our father, you know, uh, was essentially given asylum in, in Tanzania by the Nyerere government, which was very sympathetic to him. And uh, Nyerere's relationship with Malawi at that time, or Tanzania's relationship with Malawi at that time was very strained. And so my father enjoyed a great deal of protection and support from the Tanzanian government. Um, and so us being born and raised there, uh, in many ways, we, we also, you know, lived a very stable life, you know, given the circumstances. I think as children, we were not really aware of all the things that are happening in the family. Uh, you know, my mother is Tanzanian, so, you know, also that helped a great deal for us as children to feel, you know, at home in Tanzania. So, you know, having one parent as a, as a, as a citizen of Tanzania, we basically grew up feeling that we were in many ways Tanzanian, and we only got to learn that, you know, we have over time, we get to learn that my father was Malawian and that he couldn't go home. Um, and we also couldn't you know, be able to visit Malawi uh, because of all these political uh, issues that were happening. So, you know, much what my sister Lua described there, you know, we also grew up longing 
to to go back and see our, our families in Malawi. So we were basically discommunicated from our family members who were in, back in Malawi who couldn't visit us. Uh, and, you know, the ones who were, so many others who had also ran away with my father couldn't go back to Malawi. Uh, we had a number of other relatives who were kidnapped, who were put in jail for many, many years, uh, just because they were related to my father or because they were ideologically supportive of the mission. Um, so there was a lot of uh, pain and suffering um, that, uh, you know, as families like ourselves, I think our parents, you know, bore more, most of that pain than the children, because for the most part, as kids, we were not really aware, you know, and uh, even when they explained it to us, we just didn't understand what's the big deal, you know, why are you struggling, you know, why, why are you in this struggle? For us, we were still young to understand that until when we become adults, that's when we really you know, could sympathize and really understand how much of the sacrifice they went through, how much of the, um, you know, they themselves, I mean, my father survived a number of assassination attempts against him. He survived a number of kidnapping attempts against him. Uh, we were always surrounded by uh, some kind of uh, Tanzanian security forces. You know, our house was protected by Tanzanian security forces because there have been many, many attempts by the Malawi government at that time to come and eliminate him, as they have done to so many other opposition figures around the world, basically. So they were going after all these uh, former cabinet ministers and other associates, just like you know the Mutarikas were, were being chased after. So we lived in fear. We lived in fear. My parents lived in fear. Uh, as children, you know, we were shielded. You know, we didn't really see it as much. Uh, but over time, we came to realize the danger, and um, and and that consciousness, you know, also came to us. You know, because as you grow, you understand uh, what the issue was about, and you understand the sacrifice and the pain that uh, as a family went through. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. It's really quite amazing. Both of you have come from such incredible parents, right? And there's a lot of parallels, as I said, in your stories. And Jua, maybe you can tell us about that first time that you did go to Malawi, that you did visit the country that your family had come from and how that felt. And, you know, talking of fear, as Nathan just said, maybe you can include some of those emotions that you had around that. Yeah, definitely. This time I went to Malawi, um, I was 16 years old. And uh, mind you, like Nathan is saying, there had been, I, I believe there was an assassination attempt in Zambia. There was something that had happened in, when, when my parents were living in Zambia, there was something that had happened in Washington, DC. And as I said, I'm as the youngest, I heard the least about it. So my old elder siblings can tell you more about what happened. But knowing that um, I, we'd always heard Malawi is unsafe, Malawi is unsafe. And then the reason why Malawi was unsafe was because of the government of Malawi. So, um, and, and even to the point, I remember I had a friend who told me years later, a Zimbabwean friend that her mother told her, when you meet people, don't tell them you know Dua and don't tell them about their family because people could be looking for them. And she told me this years later and it, was, it came as quite a shock to me that I didn't know amongst the adults all of this was happening, but you hear little bits. So by the time I was 16 years old, I come from boarding school in the US and I get home. We're in Zambia at the moment. My father was working for Comesa at the moment and my father says we're going to Malawi. And I was like, no, thank you. And so he was like, yeah, we're going home. And I was like, um, is that safe? Are you sure? Is, you know, like I, I literally thought he had lost his ever loving mind. And my mother was just sitting there and she was kind of quiet and pensive. And I remember thinking, but um, lady, are you not going to speak up? Because last time you went home when she had gone home doing my... Um, my paternal 
grandmother's funeral, she never got to see the funeral because within just a short time of her arriving in Malawi, they came after her and they said, where's your husband? What's going on? So she said, I just need to do this funeral and then I'll come to the police station. And instead she got in a car and drove across the border back to Zambia. So some of these stories, now I'm 16, I'm starting to hear more than I did as a child are in my mind and I'm going, and we're going where? And he's like, we're going home. And at that time, like Nathan, my mother was a foreigner. My mother's Zimbabwean. So I was like, but home is in Zimbabwe and it's safe and we can go there. So why are you making us go to Malawi? Um, so there was a lot of emotions that I felt. There was a lot of fear. And it was, it was ironically or symbolically, the trip was fraught with a lot of tension, with a lot of um, anticipation. We drove through from Zambia and we, I'm sorry, we were in Zimbabwe at the time and I believe we went through um, the Mozambique route. I don't know why I'm trying, I think we did Zambia, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Malawi. I'm not really sure how we came up with the map, with the route, but I remember that at that time, um, Mozambique was still in the middle of civil war. So you could not just drive through Mozambique. So we went via, you know, soldiers. And um, there'd be a tanker, two or three cars, and then police escort, two or three cars, and then the soldiers, et cetera, et cetera. And they'll tell you, if you veer left, if we veer left, veer left, because we've seen a mine, a, a mine, a landmine. So do whatever it is we do. So a trip that maybe would have taken, I don't know how many hours at that time, took so much longer because we had to slowly follow. So that's how we went into Malawi for the first time, dodging landmines, followed by soldiers. And it was a very surreal experience to a kid that had grown up in US. It was the strangest thing. And I was like, what are we getting ourselves into? So we arrived in Malawi and I was ready. I was like, they're gonna get us. We've given our passports at the borders, that's it. I'm going to jail, I'm 16 years old, my life is over, there was a boy I liked. I'll never see him again, this is the end of it. And surprisingly, Malawi was very normal. This was near the end of Kamuza's time. Um, the biggest thing that I could say was the culture clash. I had not grown up with Malawian culture. I had not grown up with Malawian languages. I had not grown up with Malawian customs. I'd heard of them second and third hand, but I had not experienced them myself. So that was the first thing, is just the overwhelm, almost feeling like you're in Disneyland because you've heard about this mystical, magical place called Malawi your whole life and you're finally there. And it's, and it's hot and there's people and the people, all these people look like you, you know, I, I think growing up in exile, a lot of the time, I was one of the only African, you know, um, students, most of where I went and to come and see everybody who looks like me. And, you know, it was just, it was amazing. It, it, it was really, it was eye opening. And it was that feeling of, oh, this is home. So this is where I belong. This is, Oh, my features are like hers. Okay, you know. Oh, my body type is like hers. So that was that was interesting. But as I said, there was the cultural clash, and then there was the distance. We've been away for so long, and for my father, it was a it was a lovely homecoming. I know he had been in Malawi a couple of times, in and out, without anybody seeing him. But for him to be free walking the streets, it was a homecoming, and for him to take me where he went to school per se, or where his parish priest was, or the anthill that he got in trouble on or whatever was amazing for him. And I think at some point we all kind of relaxed a little bit and felt like, okay, it's going to be okay. But still in the back of the mind, it was like, let's just, <laughs> my feeling with my father was like, let's just not push this. Okay, you know, because I think at some point he was like, oh, let's stay another couple of days. And I was like, yeah, that's how they find us, you know, <laughs> type of thing. So I don't know if, if the Malawi government knew or cared that we were there, but it was a fairly normal visit. I got to see cousins I'd only heard about. Um, 
Some we were able to, to communicate, some we had language and cultural barriers. And that was sad because I'd always wanted to know these people. And then now we see each other and I don't know how to tell them who they are, who I am and find out who they are, you know. Um, and then with other kids that were like maybe in the cities, we were able to talk a little bit, but it was such a short time and so many emotions packed into that short time. And so um, that's my memories of going to Malawi. For the first. I don't even remember how we left. <laughs> you know, I just remember the stress of getting there and the first few moments of feeling overwhelmed. And then the rest of it is a blur. Thank you for sharing that. I can just env envision it, that overwhelm of just all of these new experiences that somehow also have a familiarity, right? Definitely. Nathan, you were in your 20s in 1994, right? When you went back to, or when you went to Malawi for the first time. How did that feel for you? It was very, very, very scary, just like you were. I think, um, you know, I remember, I think it was 94 when my dad, you know, finally was able to go. And, um, and so I followed after him, after he had, you know, gone in for the first time. And as, you know, I sort of remember, you know, around that time where, you know, multi-party democracy movement had grown so strong and uh, Kamuzu was a uh, very, very, old uh, as a leader his power had had really waned and so you know uh, uh, my dad decided that you know he was going to return and uh, you know he made his goodbyes in Tanzania he went to see you know President Nyerere former President Nyerere at that time you know to just you know thank him for 30 years of hosting him and, and then um, he was, he had decided that he was going to go back home alone uh, uh, because he didn't want any other family member to uh, accompany him. He was fearing that, uh, you know, if he was going to be, you know, taken in or uh, it should just be him. It shouldn't be any other member of the family. Uh, so he really didn't want my any of my siblings to go with him. He didn't want my mother to go with him. He was that fearful, and uh, he he made sure that he was wearing his bulletproof on his flight. Uh, even when you see his uh, his video of him arriving, there was a big crowd, you know, uh, that came to welcome him at the airport. You see from the suit that he was wearing that he had a big bulge. Yeah, he had a big bulge because of the of the bulletproof that he was wearing. Um, but uh, one of my older sister, who used to live in the US, she has since passed away. She was adamant. She said, you're not going to go there alone. So she, she flew from New York to Dar es Salaam and uh, decided to accompany him. Uh, so she was very brave. Um, you know, because uh, actually she was one of, she was a child at the time when my dad flew, uh, you know, fled Malawi. And uh, so she wanted to be there when he returned. Uh, so, you know, he was welcomed in a very, you know, big way. And I think even just the fact that Kanyama Chuma was able to return to Malawi was, was a big signal that the country had changed. Uh, and so, so I followed, I think maybe about a month later, uh, I flew there on my own and uh, he was there to, to greet me. Uh, I sort of remembered, you know, growing up in Tanzania, we, we lived a very regular life. You know, our father, we knew him just as the other guy, you know, he was just a dad, you know, all these other things that people were saying about him, about his history, about his contribution and about his notoriety, the so-called notoriety about him being a rebel, being this, you know, uh, uh, a feared character were nothing that we knew him about. But for the first time, I think me being in Malawi with him, it really, I started to look at him differently because I could see the way other people related to him. Uh, you know, there was a lot of uh, admiration. And, and remember that time, many people were seeing him for the first time too. So 
uh, people couldn't believe that that was Kanyama Chuma. You know, everybody will say, you know, why? You know, this is the man. He looks harmless. You know, just a short guy. He's not like a big, muscular, tall guy who was, you know, supposed to be very, very scary. And uh, because, you know, you have to remember Malawi, in Malawi for 30 years, you know, there were songs and dances, you know, again, putting his name and calling him a monster and all this kind of, you know, vilification that happened in the cultural space. Uh, so for many people in Malawi, they grew up knowing him or hearing about him as this big villain to be feared. And uh, But now when they see him in flesh, everybody was surprised. It's like, wow, this is just a harmless guy. Uh, so I remember just going around town with him and in Malawi, and there will be throngs of people just like wanting to shake his hands, pointing at him. And for me, it was all very bizarre because my dad just mingled with everybody uh, without anybody raising an eyebrow. He would, you know, uh, blend in in every way. You know, he didn't want to look flashy. Uh, and so for me to see him, the way people related to him was just really, really the, my, one of my first things that I still remember. Uh, but, but, but secondly, it's just, you know, I remember how beautiful Malawi was, you know, exactly the way I imagined it to be, you know, exactly from the pictures that I have been seeing from the, you know, the only things that we, for 30 years, we knew about Malawi was from reading this tourism magazines about Malawi. So we saw, you know, the pictures of the lake, of the beautiful lake, of the fish. Uh, and so, you know, just to be there in person to actually see that beauty was just, you know, I always remember that. And, uh, you know, the third thing was really meeting the family members who, you know, everybody seemed to know you, but you don't know them, <laughs> you know. <laughs> everybody says, yeah, you know, I remember you when you were born, you know, maybe I was in Dar es Salaam, and do you remember me? I'm like, no, I don't, you know, and I'm related to you through my, you know, your aunt is my cousin and this and this and that, and I'm like, I can't even figure out that <laughs> family connection, but but these are people who felt so close to you, you know, like as if they've known you forever, and uh, and and you 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 they're just very embracing and very loving, uh, and they they're so happy to reconnect uh, with with the long lost brother cousin, you know, and so so I remember that vividly, and and it still happens until today, you know, I still get a number of people who just reach out and say, you know, I'm related to you through, you know, your great aunt, you know, and so, uh, you know, family, uh, meeting family members and interacting with them and getting to know them has, you know, was always like the ultimate icing on the cake because these are the people who you were never able to interact before. And, uh, you know, I was never my, my, both of my grandparents on my father's side died before, you know, many years before I was even born. So just being able to go to my dad's village and see where they were buried uh, was just also very, uh, you know, uh, a great thing to experience. Uh, I remember sleeping by the lake, by the beach in my father's village, which is by the lake up north in, in Usisia in Katabe. And, you know, just sleep on the, on the sand with my dad, uh, you know, overnight with other fishermen and men who sleep by the beach was also, you know, one of the most memorable things that I remember from that first trip. And my dad also, you know, took me for a drive, you know, from up and down Malawi. We literally drove from Lilongwe, we drove all the way to Blantyre, and then we drove all the way north to Mzuzu and Katabe. Uh, just the two of us, and he would just show me all the places where, you know, he used to live. He'd show me when he was, the house he was living when he was a minister, the house that he built in his village that was later demolished by the government. Uh, so, you know, it was just really almost a pilgrimage trip, you know, for the first time to go and really see uh, where roots are and to be able to really reconnect and, uh, and find yourself. So to me, it was really um, 
a, a way to really find who I was, finally knowing who I was, especially on my father's side. I, I knew everything about my mom's side. You know, I grew up with that Tanzanian culture and everything. So, you know, I was very versed, but you know, it's only when <laughs> it's really from 1994 that's when you really started to understand Maui, and uh, and I've made a I made a uh, uh, you know determination to continue doing that. You know, I've read a lot of Malawian history so that to fill in the gap, the gap of the the cultural barrier that you experience, the language barrier that you experience. So I've always tried to really learn and you know about the history of Malawi to really be able to you know, get up to speed, so to speak, you know, for all the things that I've, I've been missing for not being able to live there, uh, you know, for as much as, you know, we could have wished. So, so that's, that's, that was the experience really. And, uh, and uh, over time, you always want to add on to that in terms of learning more and understanding Malawi more, the people, the culture, the family there. Um, so yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. And I'd love to follow up, just hear a little bit more about your continued efforts to support the people of Malawi since then. I, I know you go back um, as regularly as you can, but also maybe you can tell us a little bit more about, I mean, your father sounds like such a wonderful man and it's really fascinating to hear that he was, you know, known as public enemy number one, but also a hero to so many. So maybe you can tell us about the foundation that you plan to set up in his memory. Yeah, and you know, my father uh, believed in education, and I think it comes from perhaps being, you know, first minister of education in Malawi. He really cared a lot about education. Um, matter of fact, you know, from my understanding and from actually reading my dad's autobiography, uh, it appears he met Dua's uh, father in India uh, in early 60s. When he was I was going to ask if they knew each other. <laughs> yeah, so so when my father was minister of education, did a trip to India, and uh, and he met uh, Bingwa Mutarika. Uh, at that time, I think he was he was going by a different name, Tom Mutarika, and uh, and uh, he was a student leader at that time in India, and I think my understanding is that he was a beneficiary of one of the scholarships that uh, that my father had uh, started out as a minister of education and it could be one of the reasons why you know uh, Dua's dad uh, had to leave <laughs> Malawi because he was perhaps most likely linked to the rebel ministers uh, because of uh, the activities were sympathetic by for sure he must have been him and his brother must have been sympathetic to my father and the other ministers uh, who had left. And so, so in order to keep his legacy, you know, we as a family has, you know, been doing a number of things in his, in his, uh, in his uh, village to, you know, increase the education uh, um, or encourage students to go to school. And so we uh, have a small, uh, scholarship for primary and secondary school kids, uh, just to keep that legacy going. But also, uh, I'm a board member of an organization called Yamba Malawi, which is helping with um, vulnerable children in Malawi, who uh, you know have, have come into in many villages whereby they lack maybe proper food, proper education, proper nutrition, proper health. Uh, because of some circumstances, most of them uh, perhaps AIDS orphans. And so our organization really helps to set up businesses in those communities and ensuring that any proceeds that are coming from those small businesses, such as beekeeping or uh, chicken coop farming and uh, things like that, those proceeds are ultimately going back to help the vulnerable children in those communities in Malawi. So we do a lot of this work in Lilongwe district, but recently we've expanded into Mangochi district in Malawi. So, so these are the sort of activities that uh, I think as personally, uh, I love to, to do and continue doing as part of, uh, you know, keeping my father's legacy going and, uh, and also telling his story uh, because as you said, most people grew up with a different type of education in Malawi, which 
was uh, was geared towards only praising one person who was the president and uh, as the as the liberation hero of the country and completely ignored other people who also you know uh, were initiated the fight for independence and um, and then they were wiped off of history so we have a big job of trying to correct the history of Malawi so that people really understand the contributions by others you know the intent is not to uh, wipe off Kamuzu's history the intent is to add on to it and uh, and add other people also who played a role um, and also you know to remind people of, uh, of the tragedies that uh, uh, Malawians went through you know the tragedies that my family went through the tragedy that the Mutarika family went through uh, fleeing into exile you know the Chiumes and the Mutarikas are the prominent families, but there are so many other families that they don't have representatives to talk, you know, to, to talk and talk about their experiences as we are doing now. We represent uh, thousands and thousands uh, of other families that went through our experience and perhaps even more tragically because, you know, lucky for us, you know, we, we didn't really, end up in, in refugee camps, you know, we are fathers of more political asylum uh, who got preferential treatments in many ways by the host governments where they, they ended up. But there are so many, um, you know, supporters of them who uh, found themselves in refugee camps, found themselves in much more unfortunate situations and they, and they suffered equally and they, they suffered silence. Uh, and then what is a tragedy in Malawi is that uh, we don't want to talk about this. You know, ever, ever, ever since democracy, there's been a lot of demand for some kind of like a national reconciliation, a truth and reconciliation to allow people to speak about the atrocities and the tragedies and the pain that they went through. Uh, but, you know, this type of things has been always, you know, uh, shoved aside. Uh, lately, there's been a little bit of, uh, of political willingness to do this, uh, so we want to encourage that to happen at some point. But you know, talking about this and, and about this and representing those voices is so key, such a key thing because uh, we have to document this pain and this tragedy. If we don't learn from our history, we are we are bound to repeat it. So uh, that's my view. Thank you. Beautiful words, Nathan. Thank you. Jua, you also have two incredible legacies to uphold, right? Both your mother and your father were committed to the people of Malawi. And I'd love to hear a little bit about your work, your recent work um, supporting Malawian migra migration of the Malawian community in South Africa and what that looks like, um, if you'd like to share. Oh, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I really appreciated what Nathan has said about the situation. And it's so true that a lot of it goes unsaid and kind of, um, we, we haven't had a chance as a whole, as a nation to discuss some of these issues. And unfortunately then they, they perpetuate themselves in a different way. So in our times in the sixties and seventies, maybe well into the 80s. Um, most of the time people were leaving because of political issues. Now we're seeing that, especially here in South Africa, there is quite a bit of migration to South Africa due to economic issues. Um, so in my role as I, as I only worked for the consulate um, here in Johannesburg, there was the repatriation of citizens and um, especially during the COVID time when South Africa went into a hard lockdown and people felt they needed to go home. And some people had only been out of Malawi for a couple of years. So they knew their path home. They knew what they needed to do when they went home. There were some people you speak to and they had some people hadn't been home for many, many years. And worse off was somebody who'd come and say, well, I know, I know I'm Malawian because my father came at this time, but I don't know how to find my people and et cetera. So watching COVID, COVID affected um, 
people in so many different ways. A lot of the people who wanted to go home, you know, maybe had been informal traders, etc. And with the economy shut down and on a hard lockdown, it was very hard for a lot of Malawians to figure out what to do with themselves here in South Africa when the opportunities had been so, um, you know, had, had, had been really, really made um, much less. So um, at that time, I um, was working with the then um, High Commission and the, um, the immigration officer and, the, and mainly most of us were hands, you know, what do I want to say? We, we had our hands there and we were ready to help the people of Malawi that to have to be repatriated back to South Africa. But as I said, it was during, it was during a hard lockdown. So this meant going to the borders at all hours of the nights, driving straight there, making sure that the people were safe as they got to the border and then, you know, handing them off to, to the Zimbabwe side and then handing, handing them to the Mozambique side and them finding home and watching me, I think it was quite an emotional experience watching people feel that desperate and feel they've got to get home and understanding that feeling to a certain extent, obviously not to the extent that they, they, have, they have felt where some of these people were, unfortunately, they had lost everything they owned. Um, so um, that was, that, it was a very interesting experience coming from where I've come from to then now be involved with trying to help people get home. And that was really the, the overarching um, story of my life has been trying to get home. And so much of, you know, of helping others get home. It was really, um, it was a very interesting time period for me. And um, very hard to see. You know, it's it's not easy to to see people that you're connected to through either language or culture or um, nationality going through the roughest time of their life and feeling in a way a little bit helpless because there's only so much you can do due to constraints, whether it's resources, whether it's um, the laws. You know, there's there's always going to be the the restraints of how much you can give of yourself, where really you just, you know, want to take everybody under your wings because you're like, I, I, I understand what you're feeling, but there's a professional job that needs to be done and these people need to get home. So you put aside whatever it is you're feeling for them as your countrymen and try to say the best thing we can do is get them home because maybe then when they're home, there'll be others around them because you're home. There's, there's, there's the hope that there's somebody who can help you get back on your feet again. This is a question for both of you because I'm hearing that, you know, you've lived in many different countries, you've associated with and kind of felt close to various different countries. What is the meaning of home for you, Jua? Um, it's quite interesting. <laughs> I was discussing this with somebody this this um, holiday season because both my parents have passed on. So home for me was always wherever my parents were. And so with both of them passed on, it's I, I was I was talking with my cousin. I was like, so isn't that a home for me? You know, where they're buried is is, you know, where my uncle is. Is that home? Is it where my siblings are because they're all over the world is it Zimbabwe because that's where I grew up and I realized at the end of the day I'm I'm a single mom to a 15 year old so I was like home is where we are where we are together and there'll always be a concept of Malawi being home um, because that's where I'm from so that's home base but home has now become wherever I do you know where I set roots and decide that um, this, is, this is where we're gonna be based out of. And, and I think that's one of the things of being, you know, third culture kids or growing up all over the world, you, you don't hold on to things much. Cause if it's time to move on, you're like, okay, let's let go of all of the furniture, pack everything into suitcases and we're out. You know, I'm, I'm very good at that. But for, for a while, 
this has been home and I have put roots here. And, and for my child who didn't grow up like me, it's important for her to have a sense of home. So we always do go to Malawi. So she knows this is where you're from. This is your cousins. This is your uncle so-and-so. This is the tree where your grandfather carved his initials, whatever the story is. So she has that. Um, she has more of a thread, I think, than I do because she was born in Malawi. She was lucky enough to be born in Malawi, um, which I think is amazing. She's in some ways, I feel she's more Malawian than I am. She, she has these character traits that crack me up and I'm like where where did this come from and she'll tell me and especially when she was younger she'll say because I'm Malawian and I never had that so I look at her and I'm like wow that is so cool that you have that strong connection that you know if um I don't know if there's something that you do and it's a a particular quirk of Malawians you know this is what I do because I'm Malawian so I'm glad she got to experience that because it's, I think it's such a gift because I didn't get to experience that. No, the, I mean, the question, yeah, the question uh, and the response, both of them resonate very, very well. I mean, uh, to me, it's such, a, it's such a complex, you know, question, where is home? Because of the same reasons. I, you know, my mom still lives in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, and uh, in many ways, I feel that's home. Um, and then I so I grew up there. I went to school there. You know, I did my primary and secondary education there. Uh, so um, I know so much about Tanzania. Uh, so I do feel at home in Tanzania in many many ways. Um, and uh, when I'm in Malawi, my dad is buried in Malawi, so. I have to go visit him a number of times. Uh, I have, you know, very close family members who are there that we interacted a lot. Uh, I do feel at home in Malawi as well because of those family connection and those roots. Uh, you know, I'm married uh, with children who are American and my wife is American. And, um, and so, you know, they remind me that America is home. <laughs> so, you know, so, so in many ways, it's a very difficult question to answer and uh, and the com you know the complexity of it is that you know you you contain multitude i feel i feel like Walt whitman that i contain multitudes um and i think it's a beautiful thing uh and i was also raised in a with a father who was a staunch pan-african uh you know he totally believed in in being african first uh and being malawian second um, and uh, that was his, in his DNA, uh, you know, he talked about, you know, the need for one continental government uh, throughout his life, you know, and I remember, you know, he would say these things at a time when, you know, I was trying to be his political consultant as a kid, and I would say, you know, Dad, nobody cares about <laughs> continental uh, government in Africa, <laughs> you know, and he's like, you know, my son, you know, he will say, young man, one day you will know what I'm talking about. So, <laughs> so, you know, to him, you know, he, he, you know, that's why he, he felt at home even when he was in exile in Tanzania. And Tanzania treated him very, very well and, uh, and welcomed him with open arms. And so, because he felt at home in Tanzania, we felt at home in Tanzania. Uh, and uh, he felt at home uh, in any other African country. He would feel, feel at home in Zambia, in Zimbabwe. You know, these are the other countries in South Africa, which he also, you know, participated somewhat in their struggle. Uh, so to me, it's a complex question. And I think the problem is that there is this expectation that you should have one home, uh, you know, and, and so, the answers that I give or what my sister Lua gives is, is problematic to many people because they just don't get it. You know, how is it possible that you don't have one particular home? Uh, there's this effort to always box in everybody into this particular place. And, um, and, and, and it becomes very hard for people with experiences like ours. Uh, and so, you know, when I'm in Tanzania, people look at me as a Tanzanian. When I'm in Malawi, people look at me as a Malawian. And, uh, and they, it's almost like in Tanzania, people want me to deny that I'm Malawian 
and when I'm in Malawi, people want me to deny that I'm Tanzanian. Uh, and so it's a very, very uh, complex issue that we always have to navigate all the time. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm fairly uh, happy to, to see myself as somebody who belongs everywhere. Uh, and, and that's who I am, you know, because as an African, we all have roots that are definitely beyond the current borders in Africa, you know. If I look at my father's uh, tribal background uh, as a Tumbuka, you know, the Tumbukas, you know, originally came from Congo, you know, and they settled into northern Malawi. But then over, year, over the time, they intermarried with people who moved in from the coast of East Africa, from Mozambique and, and Tanganyikan coasts. They came and, uh, and settled with the Tumbuka. And then over, and then maybe a hundred years later, you had, you know, the, the Ngonis from South Africa who, who came and settled among the Tumbukas. And so, you know, even tracing my, my, my blood from my father's side is very difficult because you don't know where your DNA exactly stems from, you know, um, and exactly also on my, on my mother's side, you know, she, she comes from Western Tanzan uh, Tanzania in Kagera region, very, very close to the border with Rwanda and Burundi. And, uh, and her tribe as a Hangaza is, is, a, is a tribe that is directly linked to the, to the people of Burundi and Rwanda and Congo. And so, you know, uh, she's a Tanzanian, but by blood, she, she contains that multitude of either Rundi or Rwanda. Uh, and so it's very hard to also pinpoint and say where is home because, you know, uh, I wish as Africans, we just sometimes, uh, you know, uh, do not care much about that. And we just care the fact that we're just Africans uh, and, um, you know, we can recognize the borders that we inherited, but, you know, at the end of the day, in practice, we should just always remember that we are, we are one people. So uh, that's my long winded way of answering your question. <laughs> I love it. Love it. It's, yes, go on, Jua. To elaborate on what Nathan was saying, I understand completely because my father was also Pan Africanist and he always did talk about, you know, one Africa and it was something that he was quite passionate about and it's the exact same thing is knowing that the Lomways which we are part of come from also part of Mozambique and even if you look at our last name Mutarika this there that was adopted by my father um, there's variations of it very close in Mozambique and in Kenya so I've always said south of the Rift Valley, that's where I'm from, <laughs> you know, and so foreign to me in Africa is when you start going to West Africa, North Africa, East Africa, you know, well, the northern part of East Africa, that's when I'm a little bit like, okay, I'm out of my element, but anything Kenya, you know, Tanzania below, I feel like it's home, you know, and I always say, you know, the Bantu people roamed all over the place. So uh, one of these days I would love, and, and, I, and I invite Nathan to do this as well. We must do some DNA kits and find out really what we're, what we're composed of. I think we will, it will be a fun experiment to find out. And so, like you said, it, it takes the theory of being tied to just one country. Um, you know, once you find out your roots, we could find out where, come from the Horn of Africa and beyond. Yes, oh, I've just realized I wasn't unmuted and you, I wasn't muted. You could probably hear the call to prayer behind me. It's just started, but Innocent, I haven't forgotten about you. You might have thought I had, but I definitely haven't. It's been so wonderful to hear from Nathan and Jua about leaving Malawi and what that's been like for them as political refugees from, from Malawi. But, it would also be really wonderful to hear from you as somebody who come to Malawi as a refugee. I've read your incredible book. It's a wonderful story. And I'd love to a little bit of you of what the situation is for refugees in Malawi right now. I know it's a big question. Sorry, can you repeat the question again? Yes. So the question is, 
tell us a little bit about your story coming to Malawi as a refugee and also what the situation for refugees in Malawi looks like right now. Yeah, thank you, Jazz. I mean, listening to do um, it's just um, like I don't have even the intention to speak <laughs> because the stories are just amazing and, you know, although they are mixed with pain and loss, but, um, you know, they end with hope. So it's really, really incredible. Um, my father was never a politician. He was a businessman. So he ran away from Burundi in 1972 and fled to, to Congo. Um, he thought he would be in, in Congo for just, you know, a few weeks, but uh, he ended up, you know, uh, staying for over 30 years. Um, he lost everything. He was saying that one of the painful things was when he left his country, when he left his wealth, he started working for people who were not even, you know, uh, at the level, financial level of uh, those who worked for him back home. Um, so it was really painful to hear people, you know, praising him, saying what he had. And yet I walked barefoot uh, in, in DRC, in the refugee camp where I was born. Uh, and I had so many questions, you know, why did you leave? Why did you fight on? And, and so on. But as a kid, I just had a small brain to grasp all the complications that happened uh, in my country. I saw Burundi for the first time when I was 13, and I kind of relate to Nathan Nedua, uh, the first time to step on the place called home. Um, yeah, it was just like, I was you know, stepping on the ground. I'm like, this is where I was supposed to be born. This is where I was supposed to be. This is where I call home, where I'm legally accepted. Uh, but that experience was, was uh, short-lived because three months later, the president who had been uh, democratically elected um, was assassinated together with ministers and uh, members of parliament. And it was painful to think of going back into the refugee camp uh, in Congo, but we had to do that. And um, I escaped, you know, uh, death, um, an experience that I will never, never, never forget. And that still, um, sometimes I still get nightmares. It has been many years. I was 13 and now I'm 32, uh, 42, but um, it's still vivid. Um, came back to Congo and three years later, the war in Congo started in 1996. And I was on the run. My dad said, I have been a refugee before. I will no longer be, I will not be a refugee in a second country. I will either die in Congo or die in Burundi, but you young people, you can go. I was the last born and my older siblings did not want to run away. But with what I experienced in Burundi, I had no option because the options were two, to join the militia and get a gun and you know, have a protection of the gun and you know, other, other colleagues or run away. Uh, so I decided to, to run away. I had no money. I only had $7 um, and the trip to Tanzania uh, would have cost me like, $200 and uh, it's a miracle how I did it. Um, but yeah, so went to Tanzania, Tanzania, went to Zambia, lived on my own and in the refugee camp in Zambia there in Neheba refugee camp, I was 16 years old. Um, I knew Swahili's, you know, French, Kirundi, Kinyarwanda, many other languages, but I didn't know English. Uh, so I had to, to learn English and uh, to survive. And I remember friends giving me their blankets and spoons and forks to go and sell for on their behalf. And I didn't know the language to communicate. So I had a friend from Congo who spoke English and he would I'd write a small conversation in Kiswahili and he would translate that into English. And overnight I would memorize my vocabulary in the morning, I woke up one hand with my notebook, my notes and uh, my English notes. And on the hand, I had uh, my blankets and spoons going to sell. And that's how I learned the English I'm using today. Um, but my idea of being in Zambia was to find uh, opportunity to study because I felt that I needed to correct the mistakes of my father that he did not you know, fight or was not involved in politics. So I want to get involved in politics so that I can end 
uh, the cycle of you know refugee life and um, uncertainty uh, my country. So when that opportunity did not happen, I uh, got help from uh, uh, Red Cross and United Nations High Commission for Refugees, but also the government of Zambia. They located my family, my siblings. At that time, my siblings, after a year and a half, my siblings were found in Tanzania. They had run away from Congo. So through family reunification, they sent me uh, to Tanzania uh, to join my families who were in the refugee camp. I learned about lots and lots of losses, including my mom, um, which you know they knew it, but they didn't want to communicate to me because I did not have anybody to, to comfort me. Um, and now I was in this massive refugee camp uh, that had over 80,000 Burundians, uh, because Tanzania kept refugees according to the nationalities. Congolese were in their refugee camp, Burundians and Rwandese. But the culture there did not resonate with me. Being born and grew up in Congo, I just, I felt like I was more Congolese than Burundian. So I went into Congolese refugee camp to finish my high school and uh, stayed there for four years, came back to Burundian refugee camp, started um, studying, uh, sorry, teaching in primary school. And while teaching in primary school, I, I learned a lot about Burundian culture that I, I did not know. I spoke the language because uh, the stigma against refugees in Congo made me, pushed me to really investigate who I was and learned, you know, push me to learning the language and um, listening to music and just, you know, it really helped me, uh, although it was unpleasant to swallow, but uh, the result was really uh, beneficial to me. So when I, you know, when I was teaching in primary school, you know, kids thought I was, they were being taught by a Congolese and not a Burundian. <laughs> um, but the fight in Burundi, you know, whatever happened in Burundi on the Burundian soil affected the people in the refugee camp uh, in one way or another. So there were a lot of tensions, you know, which political party do you support, which rebel group do you support? And uh, some rebel groups would come to the refugee camp to recruit young people to take them to the front line. You know, fighting injustice was one of, one of my objectives and still is, but I thought I'm not doing this uh, through guns. And when uh, I thought like I wasn't secure enough in, in Tanzania, I came to Malawi. A friend uh, of mine was already in Zaleka and said, man, it's peaceful here. Whenever I think about rebels coming to recruit young people or tensions about, you know, which region your dad come from. And so I'm like, okay, I will break the road. So I had learned, you know, perfect Swahili that uh, my brother Nathan speaks, you know, uh, which is different from the one that we speak in Congo and, and Burundi. So I put on this Tanzanian accent and that was my passport. That was all I needed to travel from Kigoma, Tanzania to Mbea, where um, the border with Malawi is. And God provided along the way. There was a, um, a priest uh, in Karonga um, who hosted me and took me in and fed me and you know, gave me transport to go to Lilongwe. So I came to Malawi in 2003 as a refugee. And then while there, I, you know, I met uh, a pastor and, uh, who was an American, pastor in a local church in Malawi, Lilongwe. And, uh, Capital City Baptist Church, and you know, I was taken in, and you know, eventually they sent me to study Bible College uh, to some of what theology. Um, while there, I started an organization called There Is Hope to be able to contribute to the lives of vulnerable people in the camp. And through that, I learned a lot. I learned just a lot, and the journey has been long. And yeah, um, we did a lot of provision of uh, scholarship and supporting with uh, business creation and many, many other work, but also bringing like breaking the, um, you know, the walls, invisible walls around the refugee camp that, you know, stops us to interact uh, in a meaningful way with, uh, with the Malawians. So we built a center just outside of the refugee camp and we're providing, we're providing education and, uh, most of our clients are Malawians and they have refugees. And it was kind of the first time that Malawians and refugees are interacting uh, 
as adults um, and they're learning together, they're being taught by both you know, Congolese uh, refugees and Malawians and learning about you know, each other's culture. And at the end, people were like, oh, before I came to Zaleka, my family were telling me refugees are you know, bad people, they kill you and whatever, but now they become my friends and vice versa, refugees would think that Malawians, you know, they don't love refugees, they rip off refugees, all the aid that comes, you know, they siphon it and now they're becoming friends and allies and um, which it's a beautiful thing that I've seen and uh, until I, last year, I, you know, I retired from the work that I started and, uh, you know, the best person to hand over to was, was uh, a Malawian, more educated than me, more passionate about, you know, the cause than me. And, but then the refugees were feeling like I was giving their organization <laughs> away to Malawians. And uh, so there was a lot of um, politics to navigate, but now they understand because a year after I left, uh, there is hope, you know, the organization has grown, <laughs> more projects, more funding. And now I'm able to point out and say, hey, we are all Africans, you know, you don't have to be a refugee to fight for the causes of refugees. You just need to be someone who cares. And that's what is happening now. So now I'm really focusing on advocacy for refugee rights, because as you, you know, you say that what's the landscape of refugees in Malawi? The laws of Malawi are currently, they restrict refugees into life in the refugee camp. Uh, refugees are not allowed to, you know, by law to leave camp and stay outside. They're not allowed to take employment. Uh, they're not allowed to go, you know, by law, if, you know, everything was followed according to the law says, they're not even supposed to go to government uh, hospitals or schools. Uh, that because the laws have not been updated. And um, it's sad for many people who were born in Zaleka. Um, it's really like, it's a place that they, they don't know any other country from Malawi, but yet they are not accepted as citizens. So I, yeah, in my fight, in my work, you know, I try to explain to people that refugees are human beings. And you know, this conversation helps us, you know, who was that became the president, you know, uh, one that even the current, doc, uh, the current uh, administration still points out to some of the, you know, the work that he did and the vision that he set for the country, not just for the party. And uh, the current administration is also, you know, has adopted some of the vision that he was not able to achieve, which is, you know, incredible. You know, Nathan, you heard it, you know, amazing story. I was I've been reading the history of Malawi and you can't tell the history of Malawi without uh, um, uh, Chiume, it's, it's incredible. So to hear that they also have this story of a refugee, it helps to, you know, to bring a message back home to say, hey, the people that we call heroes, they had the same experience, why can't we, you know, be kind to them, the way that we've been kind to giving them asylum and allowing them to live in this peaceful and more democratic country that I've ever seen. Um, that's, that, 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 that's what we're doing. Beautiful, Innocent, thank you. Now I'm aware and conscious of everyone's time. So I have one final question for you, which is about the need for an integration solution that you've mentioned to me before in Malawi and what that could look like. Yeah, our, our desire is to, to have more allies who, who understand the issues of refugees and Pan-Africanism that, you know, Dua's dad and, you know, Nathan's dad and many other people fought for. Um, you know, the majority of, of refugees here in Malawi are Congolese. And the, again, the majority of Malawians, their stories, you know, come from Congo. And yet, you know, those who came early are Malawians, those who are coming now are refugees and they should be restricted to life in the, in the refugee camp. So I hope that one day the former Congolese, <laughs> you know, would say you have, you, you, there's no need for you to be refugees among uh, the lost tribes of Congo. 
you know, let's strive together and, you know, revise the, the laws that will accommodate everybody. Uh, that's, that's my hope. And I know that it's not easy to change legislations. I've heard several times uh, the, His Excellency President Dr. Lazarus Chakwera talking about the need to change laws and, you know, to reform the country. So even the president is calling for laws reform. What about me, a foreigner uh, in a place called home? I, I call Malawi home. Uh, so I really hope that um, more Malawians will understand uh, that there is need for people to like legislations to be changed. Uh, they have shown that there, are, there is willingness. There have been um, many promises that uh, former governments have 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 shown, have have uh, have said, and we really hope that one day the reforms will be made and. Uh, some refugees who want to call this place home will finally uh, get that right that is backed up by, by the, the laws of the land. Wonderful. Does anybody want to finish with any final words, any thoughts? Okay, well, I can, I can, I can just yes. chime in Go on, it. Um, yeah, I was just going to say, I can chime into what Innocent was talking about, um, you know, of this need to really uh, change not just the laws, but the policy, the refugee policy in Malawi. I think, you know, he described it very well, how outdated it is. Um, I think, you know, other neighboring countries like Tanzania, um, from my experience, have, you know, rather more, you know, uh, or better, refugee policies compared to what Malawi has. And at least, you know, Malawi can learn from neighboring countries in, in Tanzania, for example, what they've done. You know, there have been instances, a couple of instances in Tanzania whereby the country granted uh, citizenship to a number, big number of refugees, you know, some of them from Rwanda, some of them from Burundi. And those type of clemencies, you know, are things that also we should advocate that the Malawi government, should, you know, be able to grant to some of them. Congolese and Burundi refugees are in the country. Um, but yes, you know, changing policy, changing our laws, uh, we should, you know, uh, borrow the leaf from what, you know, the neighbors are doing. Um, and um, yeah, granting, you know, it's, it's definitely not fair to me that uh, a refugee who is, has known any other, a child of a refugee who has known any other, none other country, basically becomes stateless, you know, because a country where they were born um, as refugees refuses to, to um, allow them to gain citizenship after, you know, a certain number of qualification that they can meet. Um, and, and also, you know, there should be a mechanism of, um, you know, uh, repatriating those who really are willing to go back if they meet certain conditions and if conditions where they are going are safe enough to uh, to 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 go back uh, for those who are willing to do that. So there should be a mixed bag of uh, of policies that uh, based on the choices of individuals in the refugee camp and what they want to do, whether they want to stay or whether they want to safely go back home, they should be enabled to do that. Um, and so I'm all for advocating for that. Um, and I think, yeah, it's important to uh, join hands with uh, what Inua Consulting is doing and what Innocent is doing uh, in, in helping out to, you know, bring the voices of, uh, uh, of, of, uh, of, of people who are refugee status so that, you know, they they recognize not just, you know, not just by, as uh, Innocent said, you know, Malawians themselves should should be at the forefront uh, in ensuring that this happens. So um, I, I just want to pledge to, you know, uh, be supportive uh, as I learn more about what is going on with the plight of, uh, of refugees in Malawi and uh, definitely want to be able to involve myself. The other thing that came to mind is that, uh, you know, my sister Dua and I also, we have to, you know, collaborate and uh, tell our stories and our experiences, you know, growing up exile. <laughs> um, you know, there's so many of other, you know, families like ourselves, you know, we should be able to 
you know, figure out a way of telling our stories, whether it's in form of books, within forms of podcasts like this. Uh, but, you know, the stories are so rich and, um, you know, let's figure out a way to also, you know, uh, uh, leave a record of, of our experiences, you know, because if we don't, then uh, clearly nobody's going to care. <laughs> so, so that's what I will end up by saying. But thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to come and share my story. And uh, thank you, uh, Innocent. Thank you, Jazz. Thank you, Dua. Uh, and everybody at Inua, thank you, Florissa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nathan. Jua, any final words? Yes, um, to piggyback off of some of the things that both Nathan and Innocent have said, um, I think it's so important for us as Malawians to look at even the benefits of immigration and to understand that a lot of times in, if you look at case studies, whether it's Uganda, et cetera, that the, the benefits outweigh the costs and that um, immigration, you know, immigration reform can help the pace of economic growth. It brings in entrepreneurs, productivity. There are actually benefits. And when we get past the fear of what these people may bring and get to the point where we understand that there are a lot of people leave in strange, under strange circumstances. And these people are talented, they're educated, they have skills that are necessary. And these could benefit, you know, the country of Malawi and fill some skill gaps that we have. So it's, it's um, not just from a point of view of me being, I would urge everybody to, to learn more about the immigration situation in Malawi, not just from a point of view of me being, I benefited from another country taking us in, you know, from the emotional part of it and the personal part of it, but from the point, if we can look at it from the economic point, that there are benefits um, to, to immigration reform. And so I thank Innocent for taking this banner and pushing it. And, and I agree completely with Nathan that we need to speak out more. We need to talk more about it. And so that it kind of sheds people and a quote, um, refugee. And, and then just the final thing, if you look in history, um, many, quote unquote, Im immigrants or refugees have gone on to do amazing things. Um, one of the greatest refugees the world ever heard about was Christ. So um, <laughs> it's not a bad thing to let people into your country. You never know who you're letting in and what they can do to change the world. <laughs>